Hello and welcome to session five of community groups in the fall season. This is our last one. So gotta make this one count. Glad that you are here and digging into God's word together with God's people. And we're gonna be wrapping up the parable of the sower today. We're gonna first start off with some worship from Casey. So let's do that. song we could ever sing Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring Worthy of every breath we could ever free We live for you Jesus, the name above every other name Jesus, the only one who could ever save. Worthy of every breath we could ever breathe, we live for you. In holy, there is no one like you. There is none beside you. Open up my eyes.
Thank you, Casey, very much for that set of worship and shout out for doing another season with us. Thank you so much. And today we're going to read the full passage again and then focus in on the last verses. So we're in Luke chapter 8, verses 4 through 8. And it says, While a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed. And as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground. And when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. Let me pray for us and we'll get started. Lord, thank you for this text. Lord, would you allow this last session to be sweet for everyone involved? Thank you, Lord, for the hosts. Thank you, Lord, for those who have attended a group. And we pray that you bless both of them. Bless the households that have hosted. Allow your blessing and your peace to rest on those houses. And those who have come out, Lord, I pray that their houses will also be filled with your peace, filled with your spirit. We love you and praise all the name of Jesus. Amen. And as I've started every session pretty much with, I want to start with Jesus' own commentary on his own parable, because where else could we go, right? So in verse 15, Jesus says, But the seed on good soil stands for those who with a noble with a noble and good heart who hear the word, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So they hear it, they retain it, and they persevere, and therefore produce a crop that is a hundred times what was sown. And I want to first start off with the hundred times which was sown in the concluding portion of the parable. And that's to the point that simply God calls us to persevere, as we see right there, as we retain it, hear it, persevere in it. God calls us to have a part in receiving God's word and studying his word. But in the end, God is the one that is responsible to making that effort effective. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 3, 6 through 7, Paul says, I planted seed, Apollos watered it, watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. God is the one that makes it effective. I even found with my son, right, when he plays and does a game or he plays basketball or we go and do something around the park. One thing I find is that he loves to try to do things on his own. He loves, he's always like, no, abide, do it. Abide, do it. I'm like, okay. My son's name is abide, by the way, if you didn't know that. Abide, do it. I'm like, okay, abide. I know you want to do it and I'll, I'll stay there, but I know in the end that he's going to need help. Uh, and for instance, we'll, we'll be going and he'll, he'll want to put he gives a little stick on plants and put them on a mirror and he wants to put the plants on the mirror and eventually he realizes he's used these things so many times these reusable like stickers that they have basically no stickiness left on them so he'll try to hit it he'll hit it hit it all the and finally i'm like i know he's gonna ask me he's like dad help help me help me Uh, so go over there he won't still put it so i put his hand on it and we together put it on the wall and I'm kind of like as he's putting his hand on it rubbing it on the corners to make sure that stays on and he's all happy we did it together and that's a great picture when it comes down to uh, with me and my heavenly father or just all of us with God and that is God wants us to work with him because he wants it to be relational he's not he doesn't only do it for us he does it with us however he is the one that makes our effort effective even Psalm 127 2 the psalmist says, unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers is labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. And Romans 9.16 says, it does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. And that God wants us to put in the effort. However, We must not put our faith in our effort, but put our faith in God. In fact, our effort is an expression of faith. I think sometimes we can think that when we put effort to something, it's because we don't trust God. Well, that can be the case, but that is not supposed to be the case. In fact, what God calls us to do is have a faith that works, that works our salvation, not believing that working can bring me salvation, but as God saves me, and as, as, as God has saved me and is working in me, he will not only work on my behalf, he will work through me and in me. 
In fact, 1 Corinthians 15.10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace to me was not without effect. So God's been undeservingly, abundantly blessing me, and his grace has not been without its effects. And how has it affected me, he says? No, I worked harder. I worked harder. Not only did God work in me, but one of the effects of God's real work in me is that I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but God's grace that was with me. That one of the greatest gifts God gave Paul and continuing to this day is some of the greatest gifts God gives are not those things he just gives us in our lap, but grows in our heart. That some of the greatest gifts he does are not just when he gives us provision or when he just gives us things in our hand, but when he teaches us and trains us and makes us more like his son. The blessings that are not only put on us, but that he puts and forms within us are some of the greatest blessings. So now when it comes down to this passage, we see that God can bring forth a hundred times that which was sown, that the word of God like a seed would start as a little seed, would grow into a tree that will take on a life of its own. That's what the word of God is living and active. Like a seed that it might go in, it's like, oh, it's better words on that page, but it should result in more than words in our life. It should be result, It should be retained in our mind, but also result in works in our life. It should grow and transform into something totally different. And therefore, it's meant to be a collaboration. Look at this, Luke 19, 15. Jesus says, But the seed on good soil stands for those with a noble and good heart who hear the word of God, retain it, and by persevering, produce a crop. So God is the one who makes the crop yield a hundred times more than that was sown. But our part is to hear the word of God, retain the word of God, and persevere in the word of God. Those are our parts to play, okay? And we see here that this is meant to be building character in us because Romans 5, 3 through 5 says, not only so, but we also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance and perseverance, character and character, hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who he has given us. But the mission of the Holy Spirit is not just to give us a good life, but to make our lives more like God, to make us more like Jesus, to conform us into the image of Christ. And therefore, God will use the seasons of the sun rising. God will use the battle of the fighting away the weeds to not just produce fruit through us, but to form Christ in us, the character of Christ in us. And this is why God does not just make the fruit automatic. This is why God has does not, when you read the Bible, it doesn't just naturally trans, instantly and naturally transform us, but that God calls us to work with him. And then God will work in us in a supernatural way. When we go against our nature to work with God, God will work in his supernatural way in our hearts to change us and to produce Christ in us. See, God can do supernatural things through very natural things in our lives. For example, right, it says in this, in this text we read in Romans that God wants to produce in us character and character hope through perseverance. But th that's all done by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. Well, the Holy Spirit, as an axe, led Paul in two very different ways, but led him by the hand in both instances. instances excuse me. For example, we have in Acts 13, 2, the Holy Spirit speaks audibly, it seems like, or very clearly, where it says, while they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I've called them. So God leads them in a very clear way, supernatural way, or maybe even an audible way, saying, I want these men for myself and therefore, this is how I'm going to direct you through a very clear, supernatural way. But now in Acts 6.16, 6, God leads Paul and now Silas very differently, but he still leads them. Look, it says this. Next, Paul and Silas traveled through the area of Phyria and Galatia because the Holy Spirit had prevented them from preaching the word in the province of Asia 
at that time. So it said that God caused them to travel through Galatia specifically and prevented them from preaching the word in Asia. It's not bad to speak to Asia about Jesus. In fact, I'm so glad that the gospel eventually got to Asia. I, I believe in the Lord and I'm Asian. I, I praise the Lord for that. But we see the way God led them is in Galatians 4.13. Right? He had to stay in Galatia because he couldn't go to Asia because the Holy Spirit led him, right? But was it audible like in Acts 13.2? No, look at this. As you know, Paul says in Galatians 4.13, it was because of an illness that I first preached the gospel to you. So God led the first time in a supernatural way by maybe even speaking directly to them. I want you for my purposes. But the second time, he leads them through sickness. But both of those times, he led them. And this is to show us how the Holy Spirit can do supernatural things through natural things. And we are called to be those that through it all, hear God's word. We are listening to his word. We're in his word daily. Blessed is the man who meditates on his word day and night. Those who are consuming the word of God, retaining the word of God. That means we're believing it and we're memorizing it. We're holding it in our hearts. We're holding it in our minds. And then finally, persevering. That means doing it and keep on doing it. Doing it and keep on doing it and going through hardship. And the key is here, we're just called to be faithful with what God's given us. In Matthew 25, the parable of the talents, like I referenced last session, right? the master gives his servants a variety of amounts of talents or money. Gives one, five, one, two, one, one, and the one with five doubles it, the one with two doubles it, the one with one does little with it. And God has, or not God, but the master, which represents God, has an issue with the servant who had a little that did a little with it. And the whole point of it was not that some of them got more or less because that was the master's decision. But the point of it is the decisions of the men that received their amounts of talents and what they did with that. And you see that the one with five doubled it, the one with two doubled it. And what's incredible is in verse 21, the master says the exact same thing to both. He says, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Come and share your master's happiness. I don't need to read that again because he says the same exact thing to the one who did, who doubled his five, the one who doubled his two. Same exact thing. Because the master wasn't so concerned about the amount of profit or the amount that he made, that they made. He was concerned about their faithfulness. He was concerned about not how much did they make, but what did they do with what they were given. And when it comes to God's word, what is more valuable than the very words of God? The words of God that will last beyond this life into eternity. And we often think, what will God say to me about what I do with money? What I do with my relationships? What I do with my resources? These are all true questions to ask ourselves that we should be concerned about on the day of judgment. However, not only will every idle word we be giving account for those things, I believe what's much more important than that is what do we do with the words of God? Yes, it's important for us to ask ourselves, what are we saying? What are we doing with all these things? But what are we doing with God's word? Right? After all, those who are written in the book of life are not those who did well with their money or didn't do well with their money. It's those that believed God's word to the point of salvation. But now as believers who are saved, we must ask ourselves, what are we doing with God's word? Are we good stewards of God's word to hear it? Are we good stewards of God's word to retain it? Are we good stewards of God's word to persevere in it? Are we faithful with the word of God? Hebrews 10, 34 through 36 says, You have suffered along with those in prison and joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property because you knew that you yourselves had better and lasting possessions. So do not throw away your confidence. It will be richly rewarded. You need to persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. And Galatians 6, 9 says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at just the proper time, 
we will reap a harvest if we don't give up. We are called to be faithful servants. And when we are not so concerned about how much or how little God has given us, but we concern ourselves much more with what we are doing, with what God has given us, that is what God cares about. And if we keep on going and we don't give up, we will reap a harvest. There will be a harvest with the word of God. And I think sometimes we might do little with God's word because we believe we don't know a lot about God's word. Or if I knew more, I would share. If I knew more, if I had more time, God's not asking us to instantly know more or instantly have more time. Maybe God is convicting our hearts to make more time. Maybe God's convicting our hearts to learn more about. But where we are right now, the question is, are we doing what God would call us to do right now with what God's given us? Are we sharing the word of God? Are we memorizing the word of God? Are we chewing in our minds the word of God that we do understand? Are we believing what we do, what we do know? These are all important things. In verse 8, still other seed fell on good soil and yielded a crop a hundred times more than was sown. I want to turn our eyes back to the beginning, and that is the fact that God multiplies the effects of our efforts. And this is not the only time that God multiplies crops by a hundredfold. In fact, the first time this number was ever mentioned is in Genesis 26, 12, when Isaac planted crops in that land and the same year reaped a hundredfold because the Lord blessed him. You see, God is in the business of multiplication. That's God math. The way God works is he multiplies. Matthew 19, 29 says, and everyone who has left houses or brothers or father or mother or wife or children or fields for my sake will receive a hundred times as much and will inherit eternal life. And this is what kind of speaks in our face that prosperity is not just the gaining of houses or the gaining of fields or the gaining of relationships or the gaining of influence, but prosperity can also be in the loss of those things. Yes, God, for in Isaac's situation, gave him a hundred times more crops, but then God also says those who lose all their crops will be given a hundred times more than that. And the point of it is simply that we never lose when we trust and follow Jesus. We never lose, whether we it's in our losing or in our gain. In our gaining, God will bless us, and prosperity is Jesus. That's what it comes down. It's, it's Him, and trusting that Lord, you are enough for me. Leviticus twenty six eight says, five of you will chase a hundred, a hundred of you will chase ten thousand, and your enemies will fall by the sword before you." God can multiply not only the the property, he can multiply our effectiveness, he can multiply us in our in, in power. God is limitless in what he can multiply. The question though is in our limitations that we do have, do we give him to the limit what we have? God is the one that's limitless. God could do whatever he wants, but with what we can do, do we give him what he wants? And the great analogy of that is again the five loaves of bread and two fish. I love mentioning this because we have Jesus taking five loaves of bread and two fish and feeding 5,000 with it. But notice he asks for the whole five loaves and whole two fish. He wants the full meal because he wants not their fish, but their faith. He wants their faithfulness. That's what he's after with them. The people in the crowd had no risk. They were just out in the, in the fields, out, out in the desert. There was no faith for them to get the bread. But there was faith in the disciples because they had to give up the little bread they did have. And when they gave the little bread they did have, not only did God feed others through them, but they were better fed than with what they had before. And the principle is simply, do we give God what we have, even what little we have? 
Hebrews 12, 1 through 3 says, Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down the right hand at the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners, so that you will not grow weary, and lose heart. You want to persevere? Fix your eyes on Jesus. What he's done for us, what he is doing, and what he will do, and who he is. Practically, persevering the word of God. Practice God's word, persevere by God's word, and persist in doing God's work. Just that, that is what we're called to do as believers. And when we are those that delight in the law of the Lord, as in Psalm 1 says, right? He who blesses the one who does not walk in the step of the wicked or stand in the way of sinners or sit in the company of the mockers. We pull out the weeds. We pull out the weeds of our heart. We go and, but his delights in the law of the Lord, in his law, in his law he meditates day and night. He should be a tree planted, right? It's not just shallow ground. It's not on the surface, not rocky soil. We've, we've dug past it so there's moisture. And not just any moisture, but moisture from the streams of water. What's the result of this? You'll yield fruit in season. Your leaves will not wither. And whatever you do will prosper. You will persevere in the hard times. And you'll prosper when it is time in his timing. And that's the, that's the call of the believer. And therefore, regardless of if we're in season or out of season, we're called to be planted in God's word. Whether we're in season or out of season, we're called to clear out the weeds. Whether we're in season or out of season, we're called to retain God's word. We're, we're called to persevere in it and hear it. That's what, that's what we're called to do. And when we do that, we will not wither in the hard times and we will prosper in his timing. So I hope this study blessed you. Let me pray for us and we will get into our discussions. Lord, thank you for this time. Thank you for this season. I ask that you would bless again the hosts. You bless all that are involved. Thank you for the privilege of being a part of this season. And we just give it to you and ask, Lord, that you would allow a multiplication of fruit in our lives and a multiplication of the effect of your word in us and through us. I praise all in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you.